Welcome to the Tackling College Sports Podcast, the definitive resource to help you navigate your way to play college-level sports. Here are your hosts, Chris LeGates and Mark Franco, where they want you, the TCS Nation, to be your best. Welcome, TCS Nation, and thanks for tuning in to the Tackling College Sports Podcast, Session 16, the Final Four Edition. I'm your host, Mark Franco, and alongside me is my co-host, the only worker the Acme Corp actually can verify, Chris Legates. Today, Chris and I were able to carve out some time with the busy schedule of Deb Fisk. Deb has the distinction to have played for Coach Oriama at UConn during the program's first Final Four appearance. Since her days in stores, Deb wore many hats at the University of St. Joseph's and currently is the athletic director at Kingswood Oxford in West Hartford, Connecticut. Make sure you listen to the podcast to hear about Deb's current connection with the Lady Huskies basketball team. Enjoy. Deb, thanks for joining us today on the Tackling College Sports Podcast. We do appreciate your time. Thank you. Great to have. Thanks for having me on. Sure thing. Uh, Chris is in Studio B. Uh, Let's let him say good morning. Chris? Deb, it's great to have you. You know, we go back such a long way. I'm so happy you were able to take your time. I know it's a big night for you in Indianapolis, but uh, thanks for taking a few minutes to talk to uh, some old friends here as well. It's my pleasure, and uh, it's been fun. The years that we go back, Chris, on the recruiting trails and (laughs) and dealing in those coaching ranks, and uh, great today that it worked out because uh, a lot going on here in Indianapolis. I I can imagine, and uh, big night again, just so you know, Huskies tonight, and Obviously, I'm not going to ask you for any kind of prediction, but uh, what's the vibe in Indianapolis like right now? Well, you know, there are tons of UConn fans here. It's amazing how they do travel, and they love their women Huskies. And at the first, after the first round with the Oregon State fans and, you know, Washington, there were fans here, but it was everywhere you went. It's Huskies, Huskies, Huskies. So now that it's down to two, a very interesting story with, you know, Brianna Stewart from Syracuse and that she's actually completing with Syracuse where they did not want to play UConn earlier in the year. So a lot of the UConn fans have a little bit of a go get them, Brianna Stewart. Uh, but I think the team as a whole, they're excited. They just want to get the game played. Their feeling is that, you know, you've been, it's been a goal and they've been going, going, going. I think they would have preferred, can we just play the next day? Forget that day in between. Well, as you know, Connecticut's had a little bit of snow. Who would ever thought you had to go to Indianapolis <laughs> to get away from the snow in Connecticut? But everybody will be by their TVs tonight and uh, really excited. As you know, the state embraces the Lady Huskies big time. And uh, being a celeb like you are, we're really (laughs) happy. We're really happy that you got a few minutes for us today. Uh, Well, again, my pleasure. And it is going to, I think it'll be a great game. So do not miss it. It's going to be fun. And I think the Huskies, all goes well, should be reigning champions again. (laughs) Go ahead, Mark. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Ending the love fest. (laughs) <laughs> let's let's get to the hard hitting questions. All right. Deb, how did you get into the position you are in currently? And feel free to start early on, perhaps as a young baller in Red Lion PA. <laughs> yes, well that's really going back there a bit, Mark. But uh yeah, it was you know, a basketball player in Red Lion, Pennsylvania. It was Gino Ariama coming to Red Lion and uh to watched actually play field hockey too, even though he's recruiting me for basketball, but it was part of that recruiting trail and that came and uh, he and CD to just, they want to, when they recruit you, it's full force, not just about your basketball. And they talked me into coming to UConn, uh, it's up to the great state of Connecticut. And honestly, at that time, when I, you know, I visited UConn, wasn't the powerhouse it was today. And honestly, when I, for me, it was Big East basketball was Georgetown, Villanova, Syracuse, and when I told my friends that I decided that it was going to be UConn, they really thought it was Y-U-K-O-N. And uh, <laughs> like, why would you go there? So it was, it was fun because Gene Oriam had that big picture, you know, of what UConn basketball could be. He had a vision, and we were his third recruiting class, the one that I went in with, a group of us from Pennsylvania. And uh, we believed that story that he pictured, and he was very – he is one of those um, inspirational, I should say. He knows how to – a motivator – and really want you know say okay I I want him to take me to be the next level for the player make me better so uh, I think a group of us got in there and that's really what brought me to Connecticut I had a great four years of UConn basketball he had said that you know we're going to go to the trip to the Final Four we're going to win the Big East championships and I and he honestly believed him I don't think I truly understood as a player what that meant to go to the Final Four until truly you are after the fact and realize what it is today but. He had the vision, and it had us to UConn, and 
great four years. And, you know, Connecticut loves UConn basketball, period. And, and for women Huskies, they really embrace as well. So one of the things that I find that going basketball really was for me, got, had, took me to get a college education. You get that scholarship, but it was post that I find what really brought basketball for me is that that next job, or I say that the internship that leads to one job to the next job really is because of, and, you know, I hate to say I, I felt that I was qualified, but it really comes down to that I was a UConn basketball player. And at St. Joe's, the athletic director that just was hired at the time, Bill Cartarelli, wanted me as his assistant basketball coach. So yes, I was going to be the fitness center director and teach classes and do some other things, but his primary interest was, okay, we need to get recruits here. And that connection to UConn basketball is going to help us. So it really started with that, getting me into the college atmosphere of athletics. And at that time, I really thought, okay, I'll take a look at St. Joe's and you know, two or three years, I'll move on. And trying to wrap it up to not take too long for you, two years to three years turned into 22 years. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a long time. And it was one of those where I started as you were the assistant coach and you're the fitness center director to head coach of the best of, you know, coaching basketball team, head coach of tennis. You um, became a, your associate athletic director and really got in, embedded into uh, athletics. And then along that reign, uh, what happened is I ended up now currently doing the radio for the color analyst for the UConn women's basketball because of that connection where they wanted someone who played for Gino Ariema, someone who coached and knew the game. And um, inevitably, where I am today as the athletic director at Kingswood Oxford, I really feel goes back to those days from UConn. It's connected that way. It what made me fall in love with athletics. And the idea of what um, I can bring to Kingswood Oxford now is because you have that Division One, Two, Three experience that truly is for any student athlete. If you want to find a place to play in college, it can be. It may not be Division One. Division Three may be the perfect place for you. Great story. Uh, two turning into 22. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I Point think the, the, that sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I, the, the high point, Deb, of all those things, though, was actually having an office next to mine. Probably was the, the best, right? That right. clinched that's that clinched the additional twenty years. Yeah, absolutely, it kept me from saying, you know what, I'm out of here in three. <laughs> you were wow. probably thinking about how could you get out sooner than that. <laughs> Never, Chris. Never. We got some good uh, good coaching banner going back and forth as student athletes. You love them, but they also drive you crazy. So it's nice having camaraderie with coaches next door sometimes to bounce off some of those philosophies and how you can get the most out of your student athlete. And stay sane. And stay sane. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, That's Mark. right. Uh, Deb, since your college days at UConn, what changes have you seen in the recruiting process uh, since uh, that period of time? You know, I, early on, I say early on, way back in my day, it, college recruiting certainly was the – coach going to, um, you know, showcases, but there was very few, it was AAU and it was a few tournaments a year. It wasn't to the point where today I really, it's, I hate to say it, but watered down, whether it's just weekend after weekend of a weekend of different tournaments. So the idea that you had, you had a select choice uh, and you played hard and coaches were contacting you today, it's a lot of lines where, you know, there's so many businesses and people out there that or in there saying for the, the recruiting gurus that I think uh, sometimes student athletes get caught up in that, okay, the, this person's promising me this, this person's promising me that. And what they are trying to do on their own with the digital age and everything is get videos together and, and send them to coaches. And the bottom line I like to remind people is that if you are good enough, you will be found. And if the, for the people who, you know, are the kids that aren't sure, you know, where they want to go, maybe it's division three, there's options out there just to clearly, you need to clearly look at that where uh, today, Division One players, it is, you know, it's freshmen, sophomore years that they're really getting the key looks and the key touches. But that doesn't mean that, that that's, that's for everybody and that there's a different, there's systems that can go through that are a lot less crazy and that can help. So I think the change in recruiting is bigger in that the digital age and, and what is out there, but that it's a lot more sometimes, um, you know, kids getting text around the clock and his emails or different things that they're going through. Uh, for the top player, I can imagine it has to be an overload. Uh, some of those rules are put in place to help that a little bit, but uh, it's, it's I would say, 10 times, it's probably even an understatement, uh, more aggressive than it ever has been through, over the years. Yeah, great. You, you uh, alluded to the fact um, that things have changed dramatically, uh, but perhaps not so much 
for those top one or two percent. And that's really the foundation of what we do here. You know, we're sort of a, a mouthpiece for those guys that the coaches aren't banging their doors down. So I appreciate your, your outlook on that and your viewpoint. Chris? Yeah. Deb, when you speak of the AAU programs and the youth programs, again, much more prominent uh, in this day and age than they were, let's say, 15 and 20 years ago. What do you think that girls basketball is doing right at the youth levels and the grassroots levels? Are they getting it right uh, as far as how they're preparing players, not only for college, but for whatever the next level is, maybe even high school? Mixed on that, Chris, and I think that is because it depends on where, what programs and how they're evolving. And I say very good in the sense kids are starting younger than ever and they have opportunities to play. And it starts in the town leagues, you know, where it's just very beginning when they're, you know, first grade and the opportunity just to get out there and play rec ball. And certain towns are doing it great in the sense that it's not about playing five on five right away, because if you've ever seen those grassroots plays, one ball, 10 people on that one ball, and or it's a race, a track meet up and down the floor, and whoever the kid at that time that has the most skill to just go, you know, takes over the game, which that doesn't really help anybody who's never, you know, not doesn't have that natural instinct right away. The programs that are starting out with three on three, it's similar to soccer, you know, where it's like, you know, more touches on the ball or more ways that they can handle it. Those are things that actually will help develop the student, right, or, you know, student of the game. And what you see sometimes is everybody's so worried about them. They have to play games. They have to play games. They have to get on an organized team. And that's unfortunate way where it can be just, a, you know, working on skills and teaching how to actually, you know, dribble and shoot correctly and getting more of those small sided games. And eventually when they get older, as that skills develop to get into those five on five. So I do see that there are programs doing that in that early going, and that's great. And you also see the other side where everybody wants to make sure their kid has a uniform and they're playing in an organized setup with officials and uh, not always the best intent. As far as, and I've seen those grassroots and those early roots, as far as the AU range, Again, I have mixed feelings on that because a lot of times right today it's kids playing constantly, uh, which is great to see, but they never have, they never take the time to go out for an hour and just work, drill themselves on a regular basis. And the idea is that you nearly need to do the one hour, two hours a day of your individual drills to, to really work and hone in on that, that and then when you go to play the game, you can take that's where you want to try to work on, carry it over to what you worked on individually. And a lot of times today I, I see kids and even my daughter's girl, she's a 10-year-old, still young in the game, but it's like, you know, they don't want to, it's always about the organized time that they go and play and not knowing that you have to do it on your own time too. It's not just around the schedule of when you're, you know, when you're practicing with your team. We had Bobby Kelsey on, uh, head coach of Wisconsin, just uh, in our last podcast. And she's been, uh, she's gotten a little bit of notoriety and fame for her Get Your Butt in the Gym uh, podcast or, or rant that she had after one of her games. And again, same thing that she's saying, put down the phone, Get off the computer, go in, go in the gym and take your 300 shots, your 500 shots, work on your handle, all that stuff. Do you say that stuff is kind of missing now from the modern player? I'd have to agree with her and I'd have to, I would want to jump on her rant <laughs> right there because it is so true. It's, they understand the players that, you know, they're going to play on teams and everything. Okay, well, at five o'clock I have practice. That's when they put on their gear and they go. It's not one of those where, all right, I'm going to, there's just not enough time where kids on their own go out and play pick up in the driveway. Even if it's that, it's like, I'm going to take those 100 shots, 200 shots, I'm going to, you know, pump fake, dribble drive, doing, you know, those those things that they really need to get touches on, you know, call it touches on the ball, just that that familiarity. And that's that's what's sad about it is it's too much organized. It's too much of, uh, you know, even I, I'm going to say even the personal trainer where they say, well, I practice with my personal trainer once a week, so that's my individual skills level, as opposed to go out there and, and get it done on your own. I love what you're saying and you're preaching to the choir and uh, this is the message that we continue to try to get out to, you know, all these players that are from 12 to 20, you know, it's what you're doing on your own that, uh, that no one sees that will make you a better player. No doubt about it. Chris, how, Chris, how often have we said that where, you know, that's where, especially in a game like soccer, a lot of your creativity right. is learned, you know, versus right. it being in an organized uh, type of atmosphere. There's no doubt. And when we look at, again, Deb, you're looking back now on 20, almost 25 years involved in college athletics and high school athletics. What have you seen as being the toughest challenges in your career so far? As in dealing with the public in general? Or just in your, what have you seen to be the biggest obstacles for you over the years? Uh, starting out as 
a recreation director and an assistant basketball coach and now working your way to an athletic director at a prominent uh, oh, private school. Okay. What have you seen as being some of the tougher challenges you've had? Um, you know, part of it, I, I've been blessed a little bit along the way, but some of it is that you uh, get, I think sometimes, I don't want to go with this, you know, say that the woman told thing here, but sometimes it's that idea that to have people really take you as um, qualified, knowledgeable, and I think we've had, we've seen, I, you specifically, Chris, I can talk to on that, that D3 experience and some of the uh, people in your conferences that because I played at UConn, it helped me a lot and that gave credibility. But on the other side, there, we've had some of those coaches along the way that kind of have that immediate feel of that, uh, oh, you know, that's just you know, that superiority or where like, oh, really? You know, she's just a Division three coach. So I, there is a part of me I love here at the Final Four is the coach from Oregon State. He has spent a lot of his career Division three and won a national championship there. And the, his forefront, I think, is the saying about did my best coaching and it was hard to coach division three. Actually, you know, if anybody's going to talk about coaching, what you do at that level, when you have the minimal resources is really what true coaching, you know, is all about not taking away from obviously the great coaches out there, but saying that idea of like making that jump from D three to D two or to D one, it's really, uh, if anything, somebody who can work with the least amount of things and make great things is something that people need to take notice of. So I think that was something early on when I was making that decision, do I want to go up, you know, division one or two? And that was on that resume that your own personal thing of, well, I've only had division three. So I encourage those, whether it's a student athlete or a, a coach that, you know, there's a lot to be said for uh feeling much more valuable and realizing what you have to offer, because if you can accomplish it on that level, you can certainly accomplish it where there's more to offer. So six or seven months now into your new gig as the athletic director at Kingswood Oxford. How's it going so far? Loving it, Chris. Truly am. It's, uh, it's been a whirlwind and there's so many sports and uh, there's, you know, I love the, the student athlete. I wasn't sure, you know, going from that high school or the college to the high school level and what I can say about Kingswood Oxford is that it's almost like a mini college. You know, it's it's in there and how they're hoping you know, great student athletes and what they're aspiring. We've had some a lot of success in our fall season with our football team winning the New England champions. We just had our swimming and diving and boys team won the New England champions. So it's been fun to see, you know, that level. I love working with uh, there's also it's sixth through twelfth grade. So even the middle school kids, you'd love to get to get teach them that passion of what athletics can do for you. Not everybody is going on to play in college, but we have quite a few that are looking for that level. So uh, I look forward to trying to be a part of helping them make those dreams come true. That's awesome. In addition to that position at Kingswood Oxford, Deb, as you mentioned before, you're the color analyst on the UConn radio network. What's it like being around the UConn team, traveling at practice, obviously spending time with your former coach, Gino Ariema, What's it like to be able to have an inside that a lot of people don't get a chance to see that you do? It's special. I have to say, I mean, I did experience it as a student athlete, but, um, and I actually, at that time, I can say when I was a student athlete, used to think that, man, coaches have it easy. All we have to do, <laughs> and we all laugh about that because I'm like, wow, they have the life. How easy is that? Once I actually went to the side of a coach myself, I realized, boy, was I fooling myself and wow, how much goes into what a coach has to do and, and really, boy, it's not, it's a 24 seven job. But so in saying that now going to coming back into that UConn grips of the traveling, as you had mentioned, the day in and day out of what it takes to make, you know, not necessarily just a team be successful, but at the level, what UConn does pretty amazing and pretty impressive and it's been fun to watch because now I get to see it from a different perspective and it's one of those that uh, it's I also get to see the fun side of it too because Gino Ariam is a fun guy <laughs> and he likes he, and he's you know being a part of the family he never forgets that so he's total embracing of that but it's it's really fun to see even just game day what it's like or you know hear the days in between and and the preparation and what's going through his mind and, and picking his brain a couple of times you know here and there when he's in the mood to you know, reflect. It's, it's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. Mark. Okay. Deb, uh, can you speak about the financial aspects of recruiting as it relates to perhaps your current position uh, as an athletic director and or your past positions? No, exactly. What do you mean financial aspects? Are you talking for the actual recruit? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, yes. Ones that are looking to attend college and, and play. 
the biggest thing I was saying for that top tier, obviously it's nice if you can get that full scholarship. And that's, you know, depending on what level you're going to, that's not always the case, but you can certainly, uh, you know, start out with what can you can get from financially just on grades alone. And that up top is very easy for certain schools where it comes in that your merit, you're going to win earn merit money right away off that academic. So I know as we, as you know, our, for us who are educators in that athletics field, the importance of balancing the academics and athletics, it doesn't no matter how talented you are sometimes if you want to get into a Dartmouth or a Tua Brown that you're going to need those grades to go along the way. But financially, that's the first piece of it. Second piece, if it's just talent alone, obviously you can get that full ride, but there's different packages to come about. And some of that, you know, is it books that you're going to get paid for? Is it housing? Uh, what avenues it is, but I think a lot of times, uh, sometimes, if it's depending on where you're on, you're like, well, you know, I can't, I need to look at a state school instead of a private school because of the financial bounds, but as I've seen it in there, there's a lot of ways packages can be given to student athletes, so if it's one of those uh, things to truly investigate it and look and compare, you know, the apples to apples and, you know, oranges to oranges and, and throw it up in there and see what comes down, because don't, you know, second guess what's out there, there's a lot of opportunities. And do you find yourself taming expectations quite a bit or not so much? That is actually the hardest I have a, a little bit in the sense that everybody thinks they're a Division One athlete. And, <laughs> you know, I'm not one to, to, you know, crush dreams. I will help you, you know, hey, you want to think big, dream, that's good. But we also need to have a, a little realism. Sometimes it's not, it's not the student athlete that has the problem with that. It's the parent. Right. That's probably my most the frustrating in the sense that they're not understanding what is best for their son or daughter. And that has been a conversation quite often and um, some of kind of getting a little away from that, but very important that I find is that they all feel uh, that they have to play that sport year round, like 24 seven around the clock. And as opposed to, they could be a great athlete, say it's football, basketball, and baseball, but I'm going to concentrate on basketball all year long because I really want to try to get that scholarship. And as I said before, if you are good enough, you are going to be found. They're going to want to have you. And I'm a big advocate that there's something to be said for playing multiple sports, that the overtraining and the burnout factor for those kids that they feel like, well, I got I, I to get to that tournament, that tournament, that the coaches are going to be there. Right. They're actually doing more harm than good for themselves. Yeah, rest is important. We, we've, yeah. Uh, we've talked about that plenty of times uh, on the podcast. Yes. Yeah. So are, are you – finding that you're dealing more with the parents at the current position than you did perhaps at St. Joe's? You do. I think at the high school level, that's one. It's definitely much more a you know, parent involvement. At college, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a little different. Um, I think, one, because a lot of times they're coming, they're not right there, you know, going home at night and coming back the next morning with their mom and dad. It, you know, at college, you're actually you know, living on campus, and, and it's right there. Sure. But um, I think parents today in general are so much more – heavily involved in every piece of the, uh, the development of the, the student athlete. And as much as you want parent involvement, there's got to be a healthy balance. And that sometimes is where parents are really having a difficult time. Yeah, good message. Next, uh, what are the biggest obstacles facing athletes in high school that want to continue their athletic careers in college? I say, you know, if there's a place, I say obstacle-wise, there's everything you can put yourself in good plate in good position to be in. And is part of that we talked about is having good expectations. Uh, or I should say, you know, don't over overshoot. You always need to be, you know, smart. You can have those dreams, but understand that. And the biggest obstacle would just be what they put in front of themselves. One, are you doing your homework? And I put that in quotations uh, as saying is that, am I taking care of business in the classroom? Because there are quite a few that have talents, but they're not going to get where they need to go if they didn't take care of the work in the classroom. Right. Uh, Two, are you actually, are you a team player in the sense that when you're being recruited, you know, coaches want to see the total package that, yes, you know, it's great if you can score goals or make baskets or, you know, defend. But, you know, I taking it from stealing Gino Ariema's words is that you can watch body language big time. And if that kid, you know, if you're moping and showing that or you're ticked off because of this or how dare the coach take you out or you didn't catch my pass. And even those are, they're constantly looking for that body language because that says a lot and that's what you want to coach. And those are some of those things where I say they're putting up their own obstacles in the sense that it can't be all about you. If you're going to a good program and a good coaching staff, they want somebody who is coachable and who is going to be a great teammate. Yeah, we, we actually bring this up all the time, Chris, uh, right, yeah. with uh, 
uh, when Chris is out uh, recruiting in the past, uh, a player on the field loses the ball. Does that player, you know, get dejected or does he or she turn around and fight hard to win back the ball? Right. And that it speaks volumes. And, you know, some people say, well, you know, I play tough all the time. Well, there's a difference between think, you know, fake tough, I call it, <laughs> in actual that toughness, mental and physical, that is going to help out the team. Yeah. Wonderful. Chris? Deb, you've been around the highest level of college athletes. You played at the highest level. You also were able to coach at the Division three level. So maybe in a compare and a contrast, but what are some of the pros and cons of playing Division one basketball at the highest level like you've seen? And maybe even some of the pros and cons at the Division three level that you've seen as well. Uh, great question and one I, I'd love to speak about because I do feel very passionate about that the contrast and those you know advantages and disadvantages. And I'm, I'll start with Division one and saying that, you know, fantastic experience I had and I, I think it's a awesome uh, experience for anybody who can do that however that you have to understand that you do give up a lot and saying that you have as a student athlete at division one level it is a job you are there for a reason and you are you know you're getting paid so to speak to get a great education so that idea that you know I just don't feel like you know I don't feel like going to practice today well one that can't happen <laughs> at any level but that's where it is but it's got to be you're going to, the expectations are you have to bring your game every day. You have to bring that positive mentality every day. Finding time to do that schoolwork when you are practicing, if it's six in the morning and you have a, you know, a three hour practice and the night before you just got in late from traveling, you know, that turnaround time is, you know, you're not going to get to sleep in and just put off doing that paper that is due the next day. There's a lot of travel and a lot of expectations and that you will be seen as a student athlete. You are put in that fishbowl where you know your common mistake of you made some bad decisions, it gets multiplied or you know magnified. Whereas the regular student can just go to school and you know they move on from day to day. So I would say it's I, the positives way outweigh or up the negatives. But it's one of those things where I, my experience is you're going to the final four and you're traveling. And it's a week that you're gone out of classes and it's during midterms. It's the toughest to try to still have study hall on the road. And get the you know find ways to get those papers done. But at the same time, you know it's uh, one of those things where, you know, I should say that too. Like people are going away from spring break and coming back in tans, and we're all like, you know, in stores, Connecticut, pasty white, finding <laughs> finding ways. That must be really nice <laughs> that you got to go to you know Florida or Cancun. But in saying that, we're if you you know you got to you have to love it, and it's going to be your life for four years. Uh, the opportunities to do some other things that students may not get to do, you know. Uh, is, is I would say the negative, but at the same time, I, I think you can find rewarding situations. And not all of your situation is as grand as UConn. I think, you know, and you know, at Championship Caliber, there's Division One programs where you may go two and 18 on your season. And those are, you know, a lot of times it, they, everybody sees the glory of UConn, uh, but that's not always the case either for every program. So, you know, it, the, the different levels of it can be great. I think the rewarding part comes in that what you get from a team. Uh, being a part of a great coaching staff and a team and, and the idea that anybody can be a student, but to be a student athlete is pretty darn special. And I think that is what ties you even closer to your alma mater and whatever school you go, which leads me into that. That can be at division one, two or three. Mm -hmm. And the idea that some people can feel, and when I'm recruiting people, I ask or they have questions to me right now saying, well, I don't know what school should I look at? And the biggest question I'll ask them is, Here's what you got to think, too. Do you want to go to that program where it's pretty impressive, but you may have to sit the bench, and you can be a part of it, and that's great, but you're going to do every workout that everybody else does, and you're going to be just a, you know going along for the ride, but you're going to be a big part of it, but you're not going to be out there on the floor. Or do you want to go somewhere where, you know what, you could be a star right away, and then maybe they're not very good either. So do you like the fact that you can be the star and do it all, but they're not very good? Or is it a place where it's a nice fit where, you know what, if I work really hard, I could start – or I'd have a chance to come off the bench, but they're going to make me better. So the idea a lot, I say there's a place for everybody to find. And what I love, my experience about Division Three was that it was there. I could see the benefits where I came from a large school at UConn to Division Three, where a small school, the intimacy of it and that every student athlete knows every student athlete, that you can be great things can be a part of, you know, making that campus come alive because I think athletics is even more so uh, a big part of the student life at the division three level 
And uh, the advantage of that is that, you know what, there are a lot of roles in places division three where you're gonna only, you know, you practice for two hours a day and then you can get back to, to school life where the division one it's, okay, there's practice, then there's film, then there's going to be weight room workouts, then there's gonna be individual workouts and there's rules in place, but at the same time, it's, it's uh, that's, that seven days is pretty darn filled up with athletics period. Oh, that's awesome. And and I again, might have rambled. I apologize. No, no, it's <laughs> excellent because being able to talk about having both ends of spectrum from one to three, there's a lot in between there. And I think that there's a, a message there for the kind of people, again, that we're speaking to and the kind of student athletes. The highest of highs at the Division One level and Division Three, you have a lot different perspective on being a student athlete. And then everywhere in the middle, yeah, I mean, that that's a great experience. I really like what you had to say, Deb, because we've seen – We've seen both of them together, and um, when you talk about a, a smaller school like a St. Joseph, it really did uh, galvanize the campus community when teams did well. Right, and just let's talk about your soccer team, what happened that year. Like, it just caught fire, and it really, I would say best is really galvanize the community. It was something that draws everybody together, and you could see school spirit and school pride, and that's a great thing. And don't get me wrong, you're at UConn right now playing for the Final Four, a national championship is truly galvanizing the community. But that's something on a, on a national stage that happens regularly. I think on those small uh, Division three schools, amazing, uh, all the more so what really can happen in, in that community that, that takes place. Let me switch up a little bit now when we talk about the recruiting aspects again. And you get a chance to probably see a lot of, probably those high school age girls that are hanging out at the UConn games and hoping that they could see Gino or hoping to emulate some of their heroes on the court as well. When is the best time, do you think, student athletes should start to contact college coaches? We now start to hear about eighth graders giving verbal commitments to, to colleges, ninth graders. But realistically, when do you think is the best time for student athletes to start to contact coaches? Uh, I, isn't that crazy, eighth graders giving verbals? Unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, I, and it's out there. You're correct. And it's, uh, to me, I'm like, do you realize how much you're just going to change between your ninth grade, you know, freshman and senior year? Uh, and what could transpire is is mind-boggling. But I, I would say generally, and I'm going to spare, if you're saying for the top notch, that 1%, 2%, a lot of that is going to start happening. Like their schools are going to start reaching out to the, to you in that ninth grade, 10th grade when they're, they're seeing you there. But it could continue. There's always late, late gets that in junior year is the first time you're going to hear from somebody as you develop and you know you're getting better hopefully better as each year progresses so a lot of times i say reaching out to get on somebody's radar right now I, I think the men's side is a little differently that is even hitting like freshmen now uh but i would say really that sophomore year is when can kind of be that you start getting the like the engines revving so to speak to really to get in somebody's pipeline and what would you say are the best and worst ways to contact coaches well i the typical highlight film <laughs> that everybody likes to make and say and send that to a coach as one of those things where I'm saying you know that's lovely but that's not what coaches want to see like a highlight film I'm only going to see you do all the good things mm -hmm. that doesn't work you really do need to see a game tape because they're if a coach is going to be interested and take time to look at that they're going to want to see the whole thing however that can't just be a a cold call and send because those are not going to get any kind of you know, time or management, unless it's, you know, I say smaller age where somebody's just start up program and they're going to be really looking for any, any film right in there in the beginning. But if you're going to put together, first and foremost, I say the best way it is assistant coaches that if there's a, if you've had any kind of contact with them early on uh, directly to the head coach is great if there's a connection, but those are going to get passed down to the recruiting coordinators or the coaches there. So uh, I think it, it first starts with trying to get a, a contact, you know, you can say coach to coach, but if you're talking on the big division one level, it, you're going to have to get contacts early with the assistant coaches. And when you speak of that, not 2%, but the other 98%, uh, the players who maybe not as sought after or maybe aren't as recognized as much as others are, how often or do you suggest that they keep multiple contacts with coaches? I may send my resume and my cover letter in September, but within how long do you think you could, should you follow up with college coaches? A great question. And that's one I think you really do need to be the squeaky wheel. You cannot just say, well, I did it once and that will be enough. Because as you know, as a, as a coach, there's a lot, that office is busy and it's churning over a lot of information. And it's getting, as they're trying to put together a recruiting calendar and how they want to go about and it can get lost in the shuffle and sometimes that's not what they're looking for at that moment 
but to follow up again a second and a third time because they might finally say, let me take a look at this and get a little closer look. So I think initially, if it, you know, if you're reaching out in September, it's always good, you know, I would say two or three weeks later, just follow up and, and you, even the act quickly to say, if you haven't heard anything to say, I had sent something earlier, I, you know, I just wanted, if you did not get it, here it is again. And it's just, uh, it's that typical follow up that you would, you would make. And it's just more of, you never can send it enough. It's already done. It doesn't take you any longer time to keep pushing that envelope. And especially if it's somebody you really, you know, you're really, really interested in and you really want to try to get that conversation started, do it again. So the more communications, the better. Absolutely. And as apart from the worst way to contact someone, and I already know the answer to this, but I'll do this so that you can share it with everybody. Yeah. Have you ever received a recruiting email that says, dear coach Deb, I really want to play for you at Emmanuel college or Simmons college, but not the school that you were at. Yes. <laughs> that is definitely. So you know that that becomes a letter that every other school in the whole you know, East coast has received. And, no doubt about it. The worst thing is saying the wrong name, the wrong school, and something that does not apply at all. You really do need to make each, if you're going to send out to several schools, it has to be personalized <laughs> and make it direct to that school. <laughs> Deb, so far you've survived the first 10 questions. Now we're going to put you on the hot seat. Oh, and no. This is, and this is the getting to know you portion of the interview now. Getting little, to know you. <laughs> a little bit different from the, the, the general questions. but That means they're going to be harder, Crystal. <laughs> here's where we get a chance to go in detail and find out about the real Deb Fisk. Go ahead, okay. Mark. Question number one. <laughs> if we were to search your phone, your iPod, or perhaps your Walkman, what would be the top three played songs? I would embarrass myself if I admit honestly what they are, but I, I might do it anyway. So, because I am pathetically old school, so I don't even have like download songs, <laughs> which I, I that big embarrass right there, um, drop. But because I'm here at the final four, you know, at the game at the end when they say like, you know, last night Villanova wins and they have the, um, the chant, you know, uh, the one shining moment. Yep. I have that one on there, but I figured that's okay because I'm at the point. I love one shining moment. <laughs> okay. we're playing because we, as we were playing, how we love that video and when the one shining moment. So I'm going to give you that one. One and shining then, moment. Okay. One shining moment. And then uh, I can't even remember the names of how bad I am with uh, my listening to music, but it's a um, country song, and I don't know why, but I love it, and it's going to make me sound. I, I am a romantic, and is what what you mean to me. So, Aww. you know, the song, I forget the artist now, too, but it's What You Mean to Me, and it's by, I can't even think of the guy's name right now, but, <laughs> all right, Chris, stop here. That's, stop asking these kind of questions. <laughs> That's two. You didn't give us That's a That's two. We yet. need a third. We need a third. I, I don't I have to look known. I don't know what there, what is there, but. How about an artist? An artist. We'll let you off with an artist. Yeah, an artist. You? Okay. Um. Well, because of my now you now you're gonna not more to make myself look bad here. Because of my daughter, I know every Taylor Swift song uh, and Katy Perry song because she, you know, <laughs> sings those out. So I don't know if they're my favorites, but I feel like I could give you I could give you lyrics. <laughs> All right. So we're gonna go with Taylor Swift. Okay. All right. T Swift. Wonderful. Next, what book or books are you currently reading? What books would you suggest to our listeners? Again, these are tough questions. Yeah, it's I, not easy. It's not easy being in the hot seat. It's not easy. Uh, yeah, it's not easy. I tell you, um, right now, no books being read. And I have to tell you, I'm going to blame it on Kingswood Oxford, you know, the high education institution. <laughs> Since I've taken this job, it's been, I don't, I don't get to watch TV anymore. It's like I'm on that darn email answering everything. But having downtime to read has not been, has been a problem. So maybe this summer. I will get to the, you know, when I get to the beach and have some downtime, we'll read. So nothing currently. And then my idea of what I would read if I wanted to go along those lines of educating my mind. Um, you know, another good question. I have been told, uh, my husband was, is a former coach himself, and he loves, we always talk about books that I should read at some point. And it was the one um, by Phil Jackson, The Lakers, and, yep. uh, you know, a different perspective there. What's that called, Chris, that book? You know? Yeah, I know. I know Jackson's book. Yeah, I know. Um, he was one that you really should read, just because it's about getting different concepts of different coaching books out there, um, and the one by Coach K. And, of course, I read, you know, Coach Gino Ariamo's books, uh, different things, but that was more of just to reminisce on myself and see if he actually listed my name anywhere. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's more, I think, um, I would probably, so there's some great, you know, coaching books out there. You just see it, the different, different philosophies, different theories, because sometimes that can always formulate your mind as well. Perfect. 
Question number three. Do you have a favorite quote or quotes? I do have a favorite quote, and I was I'm, so I'm trying to figure it if I get this right, so I'm not quite sure. But I saw this once, and I really love it because it's something that I really feel um, that I like try to personify out there. So it's your smile is your logo, your personality is your business card, how you leave others feeling after an experience with you becomes your trademark. Hey, wow. I so like that, and I have not heard that one. I like okay, that. So I'm giving you a new one. I, when I, I love it because I really, the thing is you do need to, you know, that it, even like for the student athlete, if you're meeting somebody too, it, your personality is a big thing. And I think sometimes we just, you know, take for, for granted, you know, you meet somebody, that experience, when you, with that, you want to leave a trademark for them. Like, I'm really glad I got to know you, or I'm really glad I met you. And um, so I love it. And that's something I try to feel by. So hopefully, you know, you know, Chris has met me, so hopefully I have had the <laughs> positive experience. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was okay. It was all right. I like that. I may tattoo that on your neck, Chris. All right, cool. Yeah. Okay, number four. Can you give the listeners a little-known fact about yourself? A little-known fact. All right. Um I've already given you a couple that, you know, I am a romantic. <laughs> I was a gymnast at one point. I knew you were going to say Did that. You know I, that? I, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. So a gymnast, and believe it or not, I was, I, you know, I did the, the double backs and, you know, Sukahara. So I was pretty darn intense. I, in my early years, I always thought I was going to college on a gymnastic scholarship. Didn't even know basketball was in my future at that point. Okay. I have to ask now, was like Mary Lou one of your favorites back then? Yeah, so that actually, um, you know, that? this will age me because she was, <laughs> after I had already started playing basketball by Mary Lou Retton, uh, it was not, now again. Nadia uh, Comaneci. Nadia, Com yes, Nadia. Nadia. Yeah, that was my uh, person, the 1976 we, Olympics. She was we watched her religiously, yep. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And right. people, again, I'll have to throw this in, you were an outstanding field hockey player. I, you're right. I knew I, that. I did. I played field hockey, basketball, and track in high school. And um, I never, basketball was what I loved, but I had some opportunities. You know, schools were looking at me to play field hockey, which I was totally surprised by because I didn't go that, you know, recruiting route or like go to camp for field hockey or anything. But I love to play the game. And then as, uh, you know, now uh, our, at Kingswood, they have the field hockey game and people always say, that it's hard to understand the sport and I have to defend it. And I said, it, but it's fun to play. Don't worry about understanding it or why the whistles are blown. Just, it's fun to play. <laughs> can, now, can you still do a gymnastics floor routine, Deb? You know, Chris, I still can. I just want you to know, I can't do all the, you know, the back flips, but I think I still have, I can still, you know, I uh, can beat, well, it depends. I got to sm choose smart my competitors, but beat them into a handstand contest at any time. <laughs> all right, Deb. So when I type up the notes for these questions, the number four, it's going to be a romantic gymnast that played field hockey. <laughs> <laughs> perfect perfect all right that takes us to our last and final question in the getting to know you portion what web-based sites or tools can you not live without either for work or for personal use all right well since i already told you how i'm pathetically old school um the only thing i I'm, I, I have to it's google i have to have google so that would be my only biggest need, issue because uh, that's the only thing I, I have to find answers she needs to search okay yes <laughs> Perfect. I think you did very well in that section. All right. That was tough. Yeah, it's you not handled, easy. You handled the hot seat a lot better than some of our previous guests, Deb. Oh, hallelujah. You got something <laughs> to go for me. So we'll bring it back on track here, Deb. Yes. At Kingswood Oxford, how do you guys handle social media? As the athletic director, what are some of the, uh, the points you're trying to get across to the student athletes about the importance of social media? Well, I think first and foremost is you need to understand that what you put out there is out there forever. So, you, you know, try to redirect that. We have had, in, not in athletics necessarily, but the student body as a whole, a couple of situations where, you know, they had to learn lessons the hard way and that, you know, this isn't about, you know, you're venting what you're feeling at that moment. This is, you know, it's a, a very caring community and that is part of, you know, you have to take that to the social media too. So I think that the biggest thing is actually the negative aspects of it is what is the hardest battle. The positive is that we want them out there, uh, you know, the tweet, or I should say the tweeting part, but the, you know, the Facebook and putting pictures up there, and, and we use it positively in that sense in trying to get the word out about how great Kingswood Oxford is. And that message is pretty much the same thing we've heard from every coach that we've had here. We've actually had a social media expert who says 
once it's out there, it's out there for good. Right. And you think you can take it down, but it's still out there. <laughs> and when we talk about not only the recruiting part for student athletes, but also in the development of their play as athletes, what would you say is the best piece of advice for parents that you could give? I, you know, um, best piece would be, I think, to, to, be, to go along with it, walk you know, side by side with your son or daughter, but, and to make it be for sure what they want, not what you know, they are trying to live vicariously through them or they feel that this is the best place. You know your son or daughter the best at the same time. There's things that are circling through that student athlete that you really want to be supportive. So advice wise is, you know, be supportive, help them dream, but at the same time, you know, and not to crush it. That's my biggest thing is that, you know, there's aspirations there, but make sure we, it's a healthy balance where you understand it's what they want and not what the parent wants. And we've had several coaches on here, Deb, who've said parents shouldn't act as their son or daughter's agent. They shouldn't be the ones making oh. the phone calls, typing the emails, even when we meet face to face with players, student athletes, let the development of the, the student athlete of the kid come through. The parents shouldn't be speaking for them. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. You know, there has been, and you know, whether it's been Gino Ariama or other coaches that have said that they're not recruiting that kid right alone because of the parent, they would be, you know, very talented and somebody that could help, but we are not, you know, there's no way we're taking that family along for the ride. So that you can be a deterrent to your son or daughter being recruited because of that behavior. And what they want is if the idea is if they really want something bad enough, they need to take those steps to do it. It is filling out, you know, writing the letter, sending the email, filling out forms. You need your son or daughter to take the next, they need to be a part of it, advocate for themselves and be a part of that issue. Because if you end up being doing everything for them, how are you helping them when they do get to college? And there's going to be a lot of things they're asked to do on their own. Amen. Last one for me. What's the best piece of advice? You put it all into a little capsule, Deb. What's the best piece of advice you have for student athletes? Hmm. Best thing of, uh, let's see. When, and this is at the college, like once you get to college or in the high school range? In the high school range. I think it's, you know, the, you want to have, you want to enjoy. So find that balance of being, you know, student athlete is the best thing. I, I think I said it earlier is that anybody can be a student wherever you go to school and that's fine. But to be a student athlete at that institution you choose is pretty darn special and it really connects you. So find something that fits for you. Don't worry about if it's, you know what, it's a place that nobody you know knows that much about. It's not that part that is going to draw well. Everybody, you know, to go to BC is more popular or, you know, a bigger name. That can't be that you're driving for us. Find what really makes you connect. And once you find that place that you really feel like is at home or what you're looking for, that's what you want to strive for. So find that balance and find the peace there as well. Yes. Mark. Good advice. And uh, we're about to uh, wrap up here, Deb. So I want to give you the opportunity to uh, give any final thoughts or parting words for the audience. Uh, I think athletics is, is an awesome experience for anybody. I, I highly could think that no matter what level you are out there, finding, you know, Division One, Two, or Three, if you want to play, you have a love for the sport, there is somewhere out there for you. So you know, you dream big and, you know, you say, oh, I don't know if it's not necessarily a place for me. Give it a go. You know, shoot for the stars. And I think you'll be happily surprised that uh, good things can happen. Sound advice. And how can our listeners get in touch with you, Deb? You can find me a uh, website at Kingswood Oxford, but my email is fisk.d at kingswoodoxford.org. Um, and then the telephone numbers and all of that are, would be on the website as well if you, you know, contact me that way. I would love to help answer any questions uh, that could help in the recruiting process, or sometimes you just need uh, another somebody to bounce something off of and get ideas from, we'd be happy to do so. That's great. We appreciate that. And uh, lastly, do you have anything you wish to promote today, whether it be camps or programs that are uh, upcoming? Oh, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, Kingswood Oxford, <laughs> a great <laughs> place. They talk about the total package of academics and athletics. So I think it's a, it's a great family atmosphere, wonderful place for education. And I'm telling you, we're moving in the upward direction for athletics. So please visit our website. I, we are in the process of revamping it and making it bigger and better, but a uh, place at least to start looking because I would love to consider that. 
And in the summer, we have a, we have a Camp KO. It's uh, all kinds of uh, camps for all sports and even those in the arts and cooking and a lot of different things, but it's a fun environment. Uh, my daughter's going to try, try, probably try out the acapella, even though she's a basketball yeah. soccer player, she's going to try out the, the singing portion of the Camp KO. Awesome. That sounds great. If you want to forward those to me, Deb, I will put them in the show notes. So anyone that goes to listen to this uh, oh, podcast, okay. uh, they'll be able to access it through the link. Wonderful. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. And then lastly, best of luck tonight uh, on the broadcast. And um, just know uh, next season, if you ever get laryngitis or something along those lines, <laughs> you've got backup here with uh, both me and Chris. Uh, and but best be of luck. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we'll fit right in. Are you kidding? Yeah. No. Let me ask you this, that this is what, year four for you doing this? Yes, fourth year. And okay, just, I, I, you know, can I you just, put the math together, Chris? I was just going to say that. I was just <laughs> going to say that. Going for the fourth consecutive national championship That's right. tonight, I see a correlation between the, the color analyst and the <laughs> national champion. So Lucky Deb. You'll have to do I it for another another 20 years, okay? Yeah, right. I'm the lucky charm, and I have let you know, Gino Ariama know that, and we joke about it because it had like nothing to do with his great players or his coaching. It's all about me. So, uh, <laughs> And we joke about it, and he says, yeah, so just in case, when I wasn't sure you know, about doing it this fourth year, he had said, yeah, well, just in case, make sure you do it this year, too. <laughs> <laughs> and and we, also, we also cleared this with our attorneys. If you want to mention us on the broadcast tonight, feel free. Oh. I love yeah, it. Yes, yes. All right. <laughs> okay, well, you get now. Get, in. <laughs> can you give us. Can you give us a quick prediction for tonight? Okay. I think. Okay. I, I honestly. I the vibe is good. I think they're practicing well. I I think it can be UConn by thirty. Okay. Um, everybody else is telling me different. You know, people say different things, and the, the Syracuse can cause some trouble. But I I think they're going to come play well tonight. Awesome. And TCS Nation. Uh, keep in mind that you can get in touch with us uh, on the web at tcsnation.com. Make sure you sign up for the, with your first name and email to be included on the ever-popular F5. Email is at chris at tcsnation.com and mark at tcsnation.com. Facebook is facebook.com forward slash tackling college sports. And, of course, on Twitter is at tcsnation. On the gram is tcsnation. And yes, we're on Pinterest somewhere. I'm not going to give that out. So <laughs> thank you all for tuning in. Deb, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, guys. Your college sports future awaits. So join the TCS Nation and be your best.